Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Ian Mulhern, and I'm uh, I head up the UK policy team here at the Tony Blair Institute. And delighted to welcome you all to our latest uh, TBI talk seminar. Uh, today we're looking at the public finances under the title of Sustainable Public Finances Under After COVID. Do we need fiscal rules? Uh, and with the budget uh, uh, just a week away, a little over a week away, uh, we've got um, public borrowing this year set to come in at around 20% of the national income, levels not seen uh, outside of the world wars. And more worryingly, uh, many commentators expect that we're going to see a permanent reduction in the size of the economy and therefore in tax revenues relative to what we expected uh, due to COVID and also due to the effects of Brexit. Uh, and that that could leave, uh, by the uh, OBR's estimate, uh, borrowing £42 billion pounds higher by the end of this parliament than we expected it to be. And it could be uh, worse than that, of course, uh, depending on how things work out. Uh, and this has shattered the Treasury's current fiscal targets, in particular its goal to have debt falling in uh, the current year and also to have overall borrowing at zero by 2025. These seem like targets from a completely different world now. Uh, and, and last March, of course, the Treasury announced that it was going to review the entire fiscal framework. Uh, and we can expect to hear the outcome of that, if not next week, then certainly before the uh, year is out. Um, but obviously, a huge amount has changed since that review was announced. The pandemic has rapidly shifted uh, what was already a, a moving uh, body of thinking on the role of fiscal policy and how to uh, think about government borrowing, uh, both here and uh, around the world. Um, and with, with the cost of debt, at unprecedented lows, uh, the need for fiscal activism to stabilise the economy high, uh, and the record of rules-based frameworks, at least in the UK, uh, somewhat patchy, uh, are fiscal rules really the right approach at all anymore? And if not, how should we uh, look to control uh, public borrowing? Um, and finally, what kind of practical solutions uh, should we take from the recent burst of innovation and ideas uh, among economists in the UK and internationally uh, to inform uh, where we go from here? Uh, today at TBI, we're also launching a paper that brings together some of these ideas and some of this thinking, um, as well as uh, our own thinking uh, about this. And my colleague, James Brown, in a moment will uh, give an outline of our thinking about how well some of those different ideas might meet the objectives that the Treasury has set out uh, for its review, particularly in the light of the past year's uh, events. Uh, but then we will hear from a panel of uh, world-class economists and practitioners to chew this all over for the next hour or so. Uh, we will uh, hear first from Adam Posen. Adam is the president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington. Um, we will hear then from Gemma Tetlow, the Chief Economist at the Institute for Government, and finally from Sir Robert Chope, former Chairman of the OBR and now visiting Professor at King's College London. Uh, so we're really looking forward to this discussion. It's going to be uh, uh, fascinating. I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot. Um, and at this point, I will hand over James to you uh, to kick us off with an outline of uh, what we're putting out today. Thanks, Ian. Um, so it's clear that uh, COVID-19 has had a massive impact on the public finances. With the large scale economic support measures and extra health spending we've seen during pa the pandemic, the deficit this year will hit record levels, as Ian was saying, for peacetime, close to £400 billion this year. This will lead to a big jump in the size of the national debt which is forecast to reach close to 100% of national income over the next few years, uh, even if you don't take into account uh, the temporary Bank of England interventions. But the burden this additional debt will place on the public finances is small, as interest rates on government debt have fallen to historic lows. Indeed, debt interest payments are now expected to be lower uh, over the next few years than was forecast in March even though the debt level will be a lot higher, remaining well below the government's uh, ceiling for debt interest payments. That, that means that the current targets, um, current fiscal rules the government has are on course to be missed, like many others in the past, which haven't allowed governments to respond to shocks in the most sensible way. 
other rules haven't proved to be a meaningful constraint on policy. What does this ex experience mean for fiscal rules going forward? Well, first, they need to bear in mind that the role of fiscal policy has changed. With interest rates stuck at close to zero for more than a decade, fiscal policy will have to do more to support the economy during downturns in the future. Low interest rates also mean that there's a possibility for governments to take advantage uh, of them to uh, borrow to pay for productive investments. This has all led to some commentators to call from a shift to standards or guidelines rather than precise fiscal rules so that fiscal policy can be more responsive to outside developments. But it would be hard to hold governments accountable to more loosely defined standards. In our paper out today, we argue that you can actually design a fiscal framework that allows greater flexibility while at the same time maintaining clear accountability for complying with more precise rules. And I'll take you through that now. There's four elements to our proposed framework. First, uh, the government would have to specify a long-term debt anchor. That's where they, they would like to get to over the very long term. And using simple arithmetic, you can convert this into a baseline limit for the annual deficit. So to give a very simple example, if nominal GDP is expected to grow at about 4% a year uh, at, on average over the long run, a deficit of 3% of GDP each year would lead to debt converging to 75% of GDP, which is roughly the level it was uh, pre-COVID. In the second stage of the framework, the deficit limit would then be adjusted to take account of the affordability of debt based on the difference between 10-year bond yields and the long-run growth rates. To show how this would work in practice, with current interest rates and growth rates, uh, a, a long-term um, debt target of 75% of GDP, that would be consistent with a deficit limit, uh, an adjusted deficit limit of about 3.6% of GDP at the moment, if interest rates remained at their current level. But if interest rates gradually started rising from say 2025 to reach historically normal levels by 2040, the deficit limit would then reduce to 2.6% of GDP over that period. And that means that if interest rates remained at their current low level, debt would be allowed to remain at, its, at approximately the current level of about 100% of GDP. But then if interest rates started to rise, uh, the government would need to put debt back on a downwards path, a, a gradual uh, glide path back towards uh, its long run targets. The third part of the framework is an escape clause, whereby the deficit limit would be suspended if the economy was running more than 1% below capacity. So there would always be the capacity for fiscal policy to stimulate the economy to the degree necessary during downturns. And finally, to make sure that borrowing was only used to pay for productive investment, not day-to-day -day spending, there would also be a, a requirement to increase public sector net worth over time, that is, uh, the value of total government assets, less total debt. We think there's several advantages to this framework. First, you always have the flexibility to respond to economic downturns because of the escape clause. Unexpected events wouldn't lead to the framework being abandoned. Second, there's always this, there's the scope to take advantage of low interest rates to make productive investments. But unlike with frameworks where there's a ceiling on debt interest payments, there would always be a limit to the amount of investment you could make in good times. And finally, making the uh, deficit limit contingent on interest rates means there always has to be a response uh, to higher interest rates immediately rather than waiting until the ceiling on interest repayments is breached, as would be the case under the current framework. So that's a very rough uh, outline of the policy of the uh, framework we're proposing, uh, and I'll hand back uh, to you, Ian. Thanks, James. That's really helpful. So, if, and if anybody would like to read more about uh, our idea and also about uh, our thoughts on the uh, assessment that the Treasury is setting out to make, then you can see the publication on our website uh, this afternoon.
Um, great. OK, let's broaden this out and get into more of a discussion. Uh, Adam, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Ian, for having me. And congrats to James and his co-authors. I think the new TBI report is very solid, not just as the type of sensible framework you're putting out there, but the way in which you've characterized the past in both the UK and more broadly intellectually. Let me try to be useful by giving a bit more international context um, and also some of the intellectual context, not that you're unaware of it, but that I think Peterson Institute scholars have been at the forefront of some of this, and so let me convey that. But let me start with my bottom line, since this is, of course, a think tank. I wish we'd get rid of fiscal rules. It's an empty concept. Um, I mean, it's fascinating that we have reports of this sort that take us through the description of how many times the fiscal rules have failed to bind. Um, and if they fail to bind, why call them rules? And this isn't just a nomenclature notion, because once you say rules, you get into this notion of targets and accountability and that it is somehow separate from whatever the political context is at the time. And it's also economically unfounded because we know that whether it's the OBR, the CBO, the OMB in the US, the various aspects of the European Commission, nobody does a great job of forecasting interest rates, deficits, or growth rates. So it all becomes a meaningless exercise, frankly, and misleading. And you start getting into Thatcherite notions of there is no alternative, which isn't really true. So I just object entirely to rules. And I've been on record on this for a long time. You can go back to work I did in 2004, pointing out the sheer hypocrisy of the Stability and Growth Pact that Portugal and Italy were being punished and France and Germany were violating it that early. And the analogy I made is that fiscal rules, it's like central bank independence, it's like other political economy things I've pointed out. You adopt them as a mechanism when you want them, and then you discard them when you don't. So you're cold, you pull on a blanket. But when you're too hot, you throw off the blanket. The fiscal rules are the blanket. This isn't the fiscal rules swaddle some Russian infant tied up tightly in a blanket they can't get out of. You can throw it off at any time. Now, that doesn't mean what the TBI is proposing is insensible, but it's sensible to, for, to speak of it as a framework in a meaningful sense, that whatever government adopts this comes forward and says, this is the way we think we should proceed with fiscal policy. These are the values we have. And that's all you can do, and that's all it reduces to. So I would prefer not to go through the farce. Let me go into more detail about the fiscal realities and experiences we've all seen. So as I've been stressing for some time, and many others have, well, you have to take seriously the experience of Japan rather than treat Japan as weird. So Japan already by the mid 90s, people were talking about a Mount Fuji of debt, that the debt level was unsustainable. And as I and Paul Krogman and others pointed out in the late 90s, this didn't seem to be really a binding constraint. And what was more important was how much fiscal policy you were delivering in what form. And then we saw that again throughout the US over the last 20, 30 years, that it's been a failure to invest in public investment that's mattered and a failure to choose the right kinds of taxes, not the budget levels, not the deficit targets, not the debt level in a numeric sense. And this, again, is, of course, what's happened in Germany and through Germany into the euro area, that you have deficiencies of public investment that didn't really work out because they got caught up in this austerity mindset. I don't need to recap for this audience the damage, the huge human and economic toll taken by the premature austerity of the Cameron government in 2010 and across the Western world at that point. And they achieved nothing for it. And there were those of us who told them ahead of time you would achieve nothing for it. Your countries were not Greece. So the question is then, well, is it open free game? And this is where the key work of Olivier Blanchard comes in, starting with his AEA presidential address two plus years ago, the work of Jason Furman and Larry Summers saying, don't look at the stock of debt, look at the flow of payments on real interest rates. The cautionary notes by Peter Orzag, Robert Rubin, and Joe. Joe Stiglitz, you have to take seriously that there's variability in interest rates. And then finally, as referenced in the TBI document, the recent paper by Blanchard, Leandro, and Zettelmeyer, which talks about replacing the fiscal rules in the euro area with a set of principles. What this all comes down to are some very basic facts that now have been more theoretically worked out and justified. First, that in the 
at rich democracies, R is less than G for most of the time. The, the real rate of interest in the economy is less than the average growth rate. And as long as that's true, you should be able to finance your debt. Second, that that doesn't mean it persists forever. As Orzag, Rubin, and, and Stiglitz have pointed out, there are unforeseen jumps in debt. And so you have to be cautious about it. But that's different from saying that there was a tipping point like Reinhardt and Rogoff had claimed, which was completely false. Third, that we can discern differences in productivity of different government interventions. And the counter cyclical aspect and the investment aspect are useful to distinguish as the TBI report does. And this is one of the few virtues of the fiscal rules approach is it tries to make, usually tries to make some distinctions. The problem of course, as was seen under both the Blair and the Brown governments was even in the UK, when you committed to public investment, not everything paid off and not everything could be agreed on to be classified as investment versus consumption or investment versus waste. But at some point, one just has to grow up and accept that, that one has to make a political case for what you think is investment and just try to make that sustainable. And if it turns out you're wrong, you lose the election. But the bottom line is there is no substitute. So the real reason I'm so totally opposed to rules is because it doesn't buy you anything in economic terms and it's not clear it buys you anything in political terms either. This fantasy that somehow the left is going to be irresponsible with budgets has one of two responses possible. Either people have completely ignored what actually went on in the Western world for the last 40 years, including the fact that Republicans have repeatedly run larger deficits than Democrats in the US, in which case having the rule is unnecessary because they're clearly basing their assumptions on fantasies. Or the reaction function of the electorate has nothing really to do with these outcomes. It has more to do with what is delivered by fiscal policy than by the fiscal policy targets, in which case, why should the government's elected people be putting so much on it? The final point I wish to make is, and I know this is even stronger in the UK than in the US or in Europe, but there is the so-called MMT approach and there are people who are out there saying, well, of course, this is all nonsense and you can ignore deficits altogether. And I think where Blanchard and Summers have come out in their conflict with the Biden proposals, which I am broadly sympathetic to, although a little less worried than they are, is that, no, there are limits. We just don't know exactly where they are and the risks have to be taken into account. And therefore, one way of taking that risk is you evaluate case by case what's necessary and what's not. And to me, the strongest critique of the Biden stimulus package, which is part of the Blanchard Summers critique, is that if this kind of short-term spending to people who are not in immediate need displaces useful public investment, particularly in the green sector, that will be bad. And that's a much more nuanced concept, but it's also a much more important concept than whether or not some promise that 10 years down the road, which will never be fulfilled, that the US needs to get back onto fiscal rectitude. And the same applies for the UK in my view. So I would encourage people to read the TBI report and think about it for a future government as a framework that can be justified, but to shed the pretensions to rules and the framing of rules and make it about this is how one would do good fiscal policy. Thank you, Adam. That's great. Now, Adam, if I could just come back to you on that. I mean, I suppose um, one argument, as you say, it, it's very, it's, we're terrible at forecasting any of these things that really matter that actually drive the outcomes here, as you say. But isn't there a case that uh, fiscal rules are really as much about the democratic and accountability point that you can't get away with not being clear with the electorate about what your intentions are, even if we're terrible at actually knowing what will happen in the future. So it, it, isn't it more that it, it's, it's the politics driving the need for some kind of rules framework uh, more than the economics? I, I guess I disagree. And because, well, obviously accountability is crucial. Uh, and not just as lip service. I mean, that's the lifeblood of any of us trying to do serious economic policy. I don't see this uh, framework or what the OBR did, frankly, Robert, um, as in any way being useful because it's up to any individual voter to make their choice 
about what the are things that are important to them. And as has been seen, fiscal policy watchdogs and so appointed pundits were wrong for decades, even though there were a bunch of us screaming at the time that you were completely wrong-minded about the trade-offs of present-term austerity or long-term debt. And, and, and so now it's, we thanks in part to the pandemic, which is a terrible, terrible trade to get it. You know, we, we've now confronted that reality that the fundamental approach has been wrong for 30 years. The other point I would make if I can make an analogy with monetary policy. So when the Bank of England and others, including myself with various economists, advanced inflation targeting as a regime, the way I interpret it and the way I think it has proven to be in practice was to be an intermediate point between what are called rules and discretion. And so the, the, it, it was pretty much towards the discretion end. So it wasn't that you had to hit the target in some, some rule-based way. It was that when you deviated from target, you had to explain your intentions. And I'm not sure that this rules framework adds anything to that beyond giving this culture of, of, of trying to, to be hawkish about deficits. I think instead, you, you have to publish the budget. The chancellor makes a statement. The, lead, the shadow chancellor makes a statement. So I'm not sure what this adds. OK, great. All right, let's go, Gemma, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Um, so, I mean, firstly, I'd like to congratulate uh, James and Ian for what I thought was an excellent report and a good summary of the various different proposals that have been made for fiscal rules and thinking about the pros and cons of the different approaches, including uh, the one that you've put forward for yourselves. Um, I mean, I think I am a little less uh, skeptical about the value of fiscal rules than Adam is, although um, perhaps I would also um, support his sort of call for this to be a framework for how fiscal policy is made rather than rigid uh, rules. And I think your the framework you've set out is, is that. I mean, looking back in history, it's easy to be very sceptical about the value of fiscal rules in any sense, because the ones we've had in the UK since 97 have all been ditched when it really got to the point where they were going to be hugely binding. And with the benefit of hindsight, that looks to have been the right decision. It would have been wrong in almost all those circumstances to have imposed very um, austere fiscal policy at a time when fiscal support was needed, either in the financial crisis or during this COVID crisis. Um, but I think it does have benefits, and perhaps um, one that we haven't really touched on yet is the benefit that fiscal rules provide in managing government more generally. Um, and often the Treasury is the one department within government who has to face up to the trade-offs inherent in policy. Most other departments tend to push for the benefits of extra spending in their area of policy, seeing that, well, if there's some positive benefit to this, then it must be worth spending some public money on it. And having some fiscal rules in place has enabled the Treasury over the years to force other departments to face up to some of those trade-offs. So really asking the question, which I think is partly what Adam was getting at, asking the question, is this the best way that we could spend public money? Would we rather be spending money here for the returns that gives, Oh, and if we do spend money there, then what does that mean in terms of the taxes we need to raise elsewhere? And what's the overall impact of that on economic growth? And so I think fiscal rules or some kind of framework has helped to bring out some of those choices within government decision making. And so I think that's where I, I, I think there is value for this kind of framework that makes clear what the boundaries are on fiscal capacity. Um, I suppose just to uh, throw out a few other questions uh, into the mix. Um, given that you have your knockout clause for um, what's going on in good times, I suppose one question from me to you would be, do you therefore think that you're within your framework in, in the good times, government should be essentially sort of overachieving its ambitions to try and avoid that ratchet effect of being just about good enough in the good times and then when the bad times hit, you um, throw everything at fiscal policy. Um, I welcome your suggestion that government should think about net worth. We've clearly seen in the past when you just target net debt that governments have tended to game the system selling assets at the appropriate moment to hit their debt targets in a way that doesn't really improve the public balance sheet properly. Um, but I suppose one question is net debt, net worth is one broader measure, but it doesn't capture things like 
human capital um, and investments in human capital could deliver future benefits in terms of economic growth and therefore um, capacity for tax generation in the future. So how did you think about those other types of investments that don't get picked up in net worth? Um, would that feed through in your framework, for example, in boosts to long term GDP growth, which would then allow for higher levels of deficit, I think, in your framework? Is that how you would envisage that? Or um, is that just too difficult to factor in here? Um, you suggest in your paper that you'd like to see the government saying something about this in the budget. Um, I suppose my question is, is it, is it too early at the moment with all the uncertainty around what COVID is going to have done to the UK economy to really know uh, where growth is likely to be in the longer term and therefore what sort of long term debt target you should be aiming for? What, what does it make sense for the government to start laying out now, given where we are? Um, and finally, uh, I think when, we, when I started working on this topic sort of 15 years ago, there was a lot of debate about the extent to which greater transparency and monitoring could ease the trade off between rigid rules that don't have enough flexibility for policy to respond appropriately. I suppose we'd just be interested in all the panellists thoughts on the extent to which the existence of the OBR over the last 10 years has helped to allow for sensible prudent policy making, but without having rigid rules that push governments to do um, silly things to just stick within the letter of those rules. Thanks, Gemma. Um, Gemma, just, um, I, I guess, question back at you on that. I mean, you, you, as you say, and as Adam pointed out, we have this, this problem of uh, rules being make, made and then they, they just simply are too rigid to survive the, the, the next, uh, the next uh, uh, economic shock. Um, and I just wonder what you think, if, if we're in the world of, okay, rules are sensible, um, uh, uh, assuming that for the moment, is it actually a problem that we just tear them up and start again after the, after the next crisis? Is that a fundamental problem for a rules-based approach, or is that actually just fine? Let's have some temporary rules, let's change them again next time. What do, what do you think on that? I actually don't think it's a fundamental problem. I think the rules are more useful in the sense that it allows i think it it enables better scrutiny accountability because it enables an organization like the obr to say okay the government has said this is its objective we can assess its performance against this and similarly it allows select committees in parliament to say okay even on the government's own objectives for itself is it doing what it said it was going to be doing um, which does help, I think, to sort of slightly depoliticize the scrutiny element, because otherwise you're stuck in a world that of appearing like if you're criticizing government policy, it's only because you have different political objectives mm -hmm. in mind. So I think that's the value of rules. And therefore, I, I don't think it matters so much if you shift the framework when the world changes. I suppose it's the classic when the facts change, I change my opinion. Um, that, I don't that fundamentally undermines the purpose of rules. Great. OK, um, Robert, let's go to you. Ten years at the sharp end of these kind of discussions. Uh, what's your what's your view? Uh, thank you very much indeed, Ian. It's a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, well, last time I thought seriously about fiscal rules was in June of last year when a horse of that name ran in the Irish Derby. Uh, I made a modest financial investment at the time, as I felt it was important to encourage, but uh, unfortunately it came in fifth, and that horse has actually only won one of the seven races that it has run to date, which uh, perhaps is not a coincidence. You, you describe the, the performance of fiscal rules over the you know, roughly 25 years since the mid 90s, say, as, as patchy, which I think is probably rather generous. Uh, the, as your paper points out, there, are, we have, there have been plenty of official forecasts published by the Treasury and the OBR that showed current policy consistent with the rules of the day, but the acid test obviously comes when you have an unfavourable forecast revision that requires the government to choose between an unpopular change to the policy that it's, uh, that it's currently adopting uh, or to change the rules. And there, there have been occasions on which policy has changed in that sort of way to stick with the rules, uh, whether for good or ill in, in the early years of the coalition, for example, but more often than not, governments have changed or as in the late Labour years, finessed the rules 
uh, rather than change the policy. Uh, and sometimes, as Gemma implies, uh, for good reason. So uh, there are also occasions when governments simply, as, as, as Adam implies, you know, abandon rules because other priorities take greater place. So uh, when Theresa May's NHS package essentially put paid to any prospect of achieving the stated fiscal objective at the time and still uh, in legislation today of, of balancing the budget. So none of that's to say that fiscal rules are completely pointless or actively harmful. I think it's right and sensible that a government should attempt to explain with at least some rigor what it thinks good management of the public finances looks like and the way that it would approach it. And as Gemma implies, fiscal rules have also, certainly for the Treasury, fa been found useful as a way to impose discipline on other parts of, of government. But I don't think there are many investors, financial market participants, commentators left who would regard a fresh set of rules as likely to be a reliable guide to the government's reaction function if and when fiscal outturns were to take another unexpected turn for the worse. Um, I think fortunately in, in the UK, I don't think that's a disaster. And here I may, you know, Adam may disagree. I, I think, and I would say this, obviously, given where I've come from, that the most important plank of the, of the fiscal policy framework in the UK is the guarantee of robust, independent scrutiny and forecasting of the implications of current policy that the OBR undertakes accompanied by, as the OBR uh, does, a rich discussion of the risks and uncertainties uh, around whatever it sees as the, as the central outlook uh, implied by government policy. And in some senses, if you've got that sort of framework of an independent forecast, so <clears throat> the government can have the policy it likes, it can have the forecast it likes, but it can't have both unless the OBR thinks the two of those are consistent, that mechanism of, 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 of smoking out a medium path of what the government thinks is uh, either, well, not necessarily optimal, but at least acceptable for the path of the, the public finances uh, is, uh, is valuable. And maybe fiscal rules, which should ideally be telling you something about a reaction function if things go awry, is not as adding as much value uh, as, you, uh, as you might think. Um, and I have to say that my big hope for uh, the robustness of the fiscal framework in the UK is around the hope that we can get back to restoring that robust forecast and policy process that has necessarily fallen by the wayside because the government has been making 14 fiscal events a year rather than two, and that we can get back to that and that everybody uh, sees, uh, sees the virtue of that. Um, that said, I think there's a lot, you know, uh, there's lots in what you've said in terms of the precise rules that you've set out that ha has virtue to it. Um, whether it's terribly credible to anchor all of this on some very long term view of what the right debt to GDP ratio is, I think, strange point, obviously, Adam referred to the, you know, the, the trigger point debate there has been a path clearly policy is always set and particularly in economies like the UK rather than the US where you have less of a reliable overseas demand for your public debt of the expectation that there is probably a trigger point out there but you don't know where it is exactly and that it may not be in the same place all the time and it may be in different places uh, in uh, different countries. And I think that perhaps is one, if, if you believe that good management of the public finances and a desirable uh, objective in running them is essentially to ensure that you always have the fiscal space to use fiscal policy in large quantity and aggressively when you need to to respond to a negative shock in the future. Um, your ability to do that and the way in which financial markets are likely to respond to the decisions you take is going to depend on where you are at the time and where other countries are at the time. I suspect that, you know, if you have a, a debt to GDP ratio of 100 and everybody else is 100, you'd be worrying less than if you have one at 80 and everyone else was at 50 and falling. Uh, and so so setting some sort of absolute number up there, albeit with more caveats around it than the, than the original um, Brogoff uh, study, I think would be uh, I'd be wary of. I would be interested, I mean, given your three, the first three of your four stages, 
uh, to explore maybe a bit more of why this doesn't actually collapse down to thinking that a ceiling on expected debt interest as a share of GDP isn't almost as good a, a proposal as I, I think we have two, possibly three of the four participants in this uh, authors of the sustainable commitments rule approach that the, uh, the IFS published back in 2009, which essentially suggested partly for this reason that you have uh, a, a ceiling on debt interest payments, we threw in payments on public service pension contributions and, and PFI, private finance initiative, back in the days when people thought 3% of GDP was worth getting out of bed for. Um, uh, but maybe that's, that's worth thinking again about that. On public sector net worth, I think I'm somewhat of a skeptic on the usefulness of net worth, in particular as something to, as a prism through which to view the sustainability uh, of, uh, of fiscal policy. I mean, it might be a useful metric to think about sort of public value and the sensibleness of particular sets of investments, but I think that the way the numbers are actually constructed in the UK is not necessarily fit for that purpose because clearly if you invest in an asset that may have a high social return but it doesn't deliver a direct financial return a toll on a bridge it doesn't deliver reliably uh, an indirect financial return through higher potential gdp uh, and you can't sell it it's not clear that that's actually helping you in terms of fiscal sustainability even if you think it's a valuable thing in terms of its of its uh, you know the welfare benefits that it will generate you would also in an ideal world if you're thinking about you know getting uh, a, com a, a consistent picture of stocks and flows you would like a net worth indicator to tell you that if you reduce government borrowing by failing to maintain your road network you would like the reduction in debt to be offset by a reduction in the measured value of the road network. It's not clear that the numbers are, are robust enough to do that. If you are valuing a lot of public sector assets at replacement value, there's also the problem that every time you turn on the news and hear that Crossrail or HS2 has, you know, is now going to cost another two billion pounds, you cheer and say, that's great, the asset side of the, the balance sheet has, has improved, which is probably not the way you would want to uh to think about that um very finally uh, if you were putting and I, I agree with uh Gemma it's not clear that the that the that the smoke is adequately cleared to make now the sensible time to set out a new set of fiscal rules if that's the way that you want to go uh I think one thing that will be important to bear in mind when you do want to set them is obviously in addition to all the very complicated and difficult economic judgments about how much scarring has the pandemic implied for potential GDP and what does that imply for the future path of, uh, of the structural budget deficit. There's also the question for the UK and for other countries, for example, of what do you want to spend on health and social care as a share of GDP coming out of this crisis compared to when you went in in order to build more resilience into the system. And I think therefore it may be hard to put in place fiscal rules because you always put in fiscal rules and then have the first forecast saying that they're going to be met. It would be odd not to do that. Uh, and so therefore there are some quite big political role of the state choices to be made before you would be in a position to put those sorts of, you know, medium term deficit targets in place if you wanted to have them. So let me leave it there. Thanks Robert, that's great. Um, I, I guess in terms of your uh, question Robert about the idea of debt interest ceilings, um, one of the things that we had been uh, struggling with is the idea that those seem to be uh, suffer the kind of problem that they're either too high uh, to be useless or too low to be credible. Um, and potentially with the maturity of UK government debt that they perhaps provide more of a binding constraint on the next chancellor for one's own actions uh, rather than the current chancellor. Um, I don't know whether you think that's a, that's a, a, an issue. But I also had a question for you about this, the kind of broader movement with the um, uh, the ideas from from uh, Summers and Furman and Blanchard for standards and this kind these kind of more discretion based uh, approaches to this this question. What, do you think that's a viable option for the UK, uh, from and particularly from the OBR's perspective, or does that uh, undermine too much the kind of accountability framework that you, that, you, that you think is important? Well, the notion of standards would be 
consistent with a this is a broader framework and let's not pretend to a degree of precision and to commitment around a set of precise reaction functions that no one's actually going to believe. I have to say, I mean, I've, I've, I've listened to a couple of presentations on the on the uh, the summer of the, um, the Blanchard standards proposal. One of them seemed to imply that, you know, in addition to economists, this would bring lawyers into the discussion of whether this was being adhered to. And I'm what, you know, I'm pretty convinced that the one thing that fiscal policy management does not need yeah, is I the greater that, involvement of lawyers. Let me assure you that's a straw man. None of them are proposing that. Okay, well, that, that, that's good news. Um, I, I think one, one challenge, particularly for independent watchdogs, is if you ask them to give the government marks out of 10 or a test fail test, on an imprecisely defined exam question. Uh, now that may, you know, it may be the case that it is not sensible to ask a precisely defined exam question, but putting an ostensibly technocratic non-political organization into the place of judging whether the government is adhering to something that is poorly defined and that therefore there are political consequences and challenges for the organization of then firming up that uh that standard or that uh, that commitment uh, and then having to explain why you said it passed or failed it this time and then six months later why it passed or failed it that time when people will say well surely haven't you just changed what you mean by adherence to the standard so i from the perspective of a former watchdog i um i, I would i would rather be asked as part of a broader remit to judge against a well-defined target than something that I was supposed to make up as I went along. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's let's open it out to some Q and A. Um, uh, got a question here from David Brito. David has a question about the Biden administration's plan. David, do you want to ask your question? Hi everyone. Um, my question is about the, stim uh, the Biden stimulus plan, 1.9 trillion stimulus pledge to support the pandemic recovery. While in the UK there has been talk of tax rises in the forthcoming March budget. So my question is sort of uh, broader uh, for, the, um, for the people listening. Do you think the Chancellor should be announcing tax rises in the budget or should the UK be aiming to act big and if so, how big? Okay, great. And then um, Alex Metcalf. Alex, Alex has a question which I think Adam has already answered, but um, interesting for the discussion. So Alex, do you want to ask your question? Hi Ian, yeah of course. So uh, this question is around the, the discussion we had around fiscal rules, uh, where I was wondering whether Adam felt there might be value within government in having fiscal rules. So in, in how we negotiate between treasuries or ministries of finance uh, in setting up what spending is available to line ministries and departments. Great. And um, Jiga has a question on, um, Jiga Kakad has a question on the policies of all this. Uh, I can unmute him. No, I can't. Okay, so Jiga asks, has the cult of fiscal prudence in the UK blinded politicians and economists to the appropriate role of fiscal stimulus? Okay, so we've got three questions there. One is about the immediate uh, fiscal stance the government should take at the coming budget. Uh, one about the role of rules within uh, spending control and, and the third there about the kind of politics of all this. Um, Adam, shall I come to you first? Um, sorry, I was typing some responses to a few questions which I didn't realize got in anybody's way. Um, in terms of the Biden program, I mean, you look at the Biden program and roughly 70% of it is working the problem. It's funding for vaccine distribution, it's funding for frontline workers, it's support for state and local governments, it's extending unemployment benefits. And most of these things, frankly, the UK has been doing a better job than the US, in particular on the vaccine distribution, obviously. Um, and so in that sense, I don't think you need to go as big as the, U as the US did. Then you got the remaining 25 to 30% of the package, which is the direct checks to individuals. And the cutoff number for that, uh, there's an income limit. And I agree that it should be an incredibly simple rule, no complicated needs-based test. 
So there's some debate as to how low that limit should be. It's going to probably be higher than it needs to be. Um, does the UK need to emulate that? I'm not up enough on the poverty statistics and, and the implementation. Since the UK has a better welfare state than the US, as much as it's been undercut by recent Tory governments, I would presume that they could more efficiently target aid than the US is doing. Um, also because of the way the party parliamentary system works, which obviously Gemma, James, Robert all know better than I do. Um, you don't have to make this kind of side overpayment to get your budget through the way you do in the US where there's a lot more, a lot less party discipline. So I'm not sure it's a good comparison, but then going to the, you know, fiscal prudence call, um, that is where I think the UK has messed up repeatedly more than the US, not as bad as Germany inflicting it on other countries in the Euro area, but badly. Um, and the starting in the spring of 2010 with Mervyn King um, and then the whole pas de deux we had with Cameron's government. Um, but again, and I think one of the most important things Robert said in his remarks was the point that particularly for the UK, but for all countries, that it matters a lot what other countries are doing. And, and so for the UK to be talking about moving into a fiscal consolidation right now, when none of the other major economies are doing so, I think it's, it's, it's an example of some cult or bad ideology or something. It, it just, there's no justification for it. Um, finally, on the issue of within government, and I assume Gemma in particular will have a different view, but I, I view the idea of Her Majesty's Treasury of using fiscal spending limits as a club with which to beat down excessive department demands as basically a very cowardly third best. It's like when a, a private corporation wants to fire a bunch of people and they pay McKinsey or some other consulting firm to come in and say, you really should fire a bunch of people. And it's what they want to do, but then they just get cover for it. I, I mean, I don't think that's the way to go. Similarly, I don't think it's a substitute, and this is echo some of the things both James and Gemma said, I don't think this is a substitute for an elected government making priorities and having to justify, yes, we're going to cut back on Trident or defense or whatever, but no, we're not going to cut back on tech investment. And using these, these bottom, top down, excuse me, debt rules, I think leads to bad allocation. Okay, great. Uh, Gemma, do you want to go on any of those questions? Um, sure. Uh, I think on the uh, Biden administration question, I would uh, agree with Adam that it's important to sort of think, make sure we're comparing like with like. And as Adam said, a lot of the US $1.9 trillion is on things that the UK has been spending quite heavily on already, like uh, vaccines and support for public services and the like. Um, I think Adam is right too that the UK benefit system probably has an easier job of targeting additional support to low income families uh, without using the sort of direct mail checks that have been used in the US. And certainly the evidence in the UK is that sort of middle and higher income families have quite often been doing quite a lot of saving during the COVID crisis. So um, targeting additional public spending uh, there doesn't seem like the best use of public funds at the moment. Um, having said that, uh, the other part of the question was, uh, should you be doing tax rises or continuing with fiscal support now? Um, I, I personally would be surprised if the uh, budget lays out significant uh, near-term tax rises. Um, I think there is fairly widespread acceptance that there is no immediate pressure on the government to try and immediately cut back on public borrowing, although obviously um, on, on current plans, and even if some of the current support measures were extended somewhat into next year, we would be looking at fiscal policy being less supportive in 2021 financial year than it has been in the 2020 financial year. If that goes alongside uh, further opening up of the economy and getting closer back to businesses being able to operate normally, that may make sense. Uh, I think the, the sort of fiscal policy that's needed in 2021 uh, should be tied to the state of the lockdown rules as well. So continuing to provide support to those parts of the economy that are constrained from operating normally. This has not been a normal kind of recession where uh, it's because of a shortfall of demand in the private sector or something wrong with some types of businesses. It's been very much a government imposed shutdown of parts of the economy. And that's been reflected in the nature of the fiscal policy response. And I would expect 
the budget will extend some of the measures that are currently in place, given what we saw from Boris Johnson on Monday about the roadmap out of lockdown that suggests that it's going to be some months still until a lot of businesses are able to reopen again. Um, has the cult of fiscal prudence uh, blinded politicians uh, and economists to the role of fiscal stimulus? Uh, I think uh, economists have been on a journey over the last few decades from a world in which we worried hugely about um, fiscal irresponsibility and the risk of runaway inflation um, if policy was too loose, um, to a world where many people have spent their entire working lives, uh, myself included, never experiencing very high levels of inflation. And so uh, there is a growing question out there about should we, how bad would it be to risk uh, running things a bit hot and leaving policy a bit loose for a while? Um, so I, I think there is a reassessment of that. I personally don't quite know um, where to come down on that, but I think it's an interesting question for uh, that's being debated at the moment. Great, thank you, Robert. Do you want to have a shot at that? Uh, sure. Um, I think just uh, just uh, an opening remark on the Biden package. Uh, Adam mentioned, you know, MMT earlier on, and I, I I've I have enjoyed the sight of both uh, Larry and Olivier, who have had pretty rude things to say about MMT. Uh, doing what the MMT people say, which is that you should judge the merits of large fiscal expansions not on affordability, but on their potential impact on inflation, which is exactly, I think, what Ms. Kelton uh, would be arguing, probably not necessarily reaching the same conclusion, uh, though. On the substance of, of the package, I, I think I would agree very much with, with Adam uh, and with, with Gemma. Uh, there seems to be a lot of very sensible uh, public services uh, spending, uh, the vaccinations, uh, helping schools, etc. Um, and that the case uh, for the uh, the more sort of pure demand boost uh, of the of the household payments is less clear and the distributional argument for it would be uh, less obvious uh, in the UK anyway. Um, I, I think again, as, as Gemma was saying, I would be surprised to see any large tax cuts or tax increases implemented in the near term uh, in the UK. You might have some things announced that take effect uh, further into the future, but it's not obvious that, you know, we know enough about the evolution of demand and supply coming out of this, that there's very clearly a case just for a pure, you know, demand boost at this point, as distinct from what, you know, Paul Krugman would describe more as a disaster relief justification for uh, for spending at that stage. And I would also, uh, you know, the case, if you believe that there is going to be a uh, an increase in the structural budget deficit coming out of this and a need therefore for some fiscal adjustment at some point, I don't see many people arguing that you would want to do that very quickly. I think again, coming back to my example of the health and social care, you know, there's an interesting political choice there. If you were going to justify some tax increases further into the line, rather than a rather dubious case for saying we need to tighten policy in order to quote unquote pay back some of what we have borrowed in the last uh, 18 months or so for which there isn't a very strong case but saying look if in the future you want to have a permanently larger state in terms of what you're spending on health and social care meeting that largely from higher taxes doesn't seem to me to be uh, an absurd argument leaving aside your notion of what the right pacing is for uh, uh, for the macroeconomic needs. Uh, on usefulness to the Treasury, all I would say there is that I, you know, from my experience and the people I've spoken to over many years, the Treasury certainly finds it useful. You might think, well, if nobody take outside takes fiscal rules terribly seriously, then why should they be taken seriously within government? But, you know, the Treasury uh, does, you know, find it useful as a disciplining device in terms of telling a lot of departments with uh, inconsistent overall demands for more money that there has to be some sort of overarching uh, constraint on that. Uh, arguably much more important as a constraint is not whether it's framed in some sort of rules framework, but whether you've just basically got number 10 and number 11 standing shoulder to shoulder and, and taking a consistent uh, line on this. Uh, does fiscal prudence blind us to stimulus? I don't think so. I think 
a, a very difficult challenge at the moment is, you know, what do you need to do in the wake of a negative shock that pushes up debt and the deficit to ensure that you are in a position to have the fiscal space to respond again when some other shock comes along further down the line. Now, and clearly one worry is that, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, an upward, uh, you have a shock that just pushes your debt to GDP ratio up, let's say it doesn't leave you with a large structural deficit, you push that up. Most people would say, Simon Ren Lewis, for example, that, look, you really don't want to be trying to bring that down very quickly. Yes, you'd like to see the debt to GDP ratio falling, quote unquote, in good times, but don't go gangbusters about it and make a, a bad situation worse. There's clearly a worry, though, if you're in a world where you think the good times are never going to last long enough to stop the debt to GDP ratio just ratcheting up with each you know, decade by decade shock that comes along. And that, that puts you in a rather more difficult uh, situation. So the argument for fiscal, so for example, you could say if you go back into history that if the Labour government had been more ambitious about fiscal uh, policy, uh, been more conservatively fiscally in the run up to the financial crisis, when the UK had a relatively large structural budget deficit compared to other countries, had debt rising, when most other countries had it falling, that that would have actually put you in a position to have a more aggressive Keynesian response and to have not gone into uh, consolidation as quickly as the government then felt it necessary to do uh, coming out of the, out of the uh, financial crisis. Last point on fiscal prudence is uh, back to horses. There is a horse called fiscal prudence running in the 8.15 at Wolverhampton on Friday uh, so you might want to get a bet in on that because I'm not sure anybody's going to bet on fiscal prudence in other contexts at the moment. Thanks for that tip, uh, Robert. Um, James, do you want to come back in on any of that and also on any of the questions that the panellists have raised? Sure. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot uh, to, to the panellists for their comments, uh, which are really helpful. Um, uh, yeah, I think to, to sort of start off with the, the questions from the audience, um, I think you know, that there has been to some extent, uh, 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 an overemphasis on fiscal prudence over the last um, 10, 20 years. I think it's I think you could, the, the, the case that the recovery after the financial crisis was slowed down um, by premature austerity is quite a strong one. Uh, and I think actually one of the arguments in favour of a framework like ours is that it gives cover for doing um, a fiscal stimulus in bad times to by reassuring people that you know, fiscal prudence hasn't gone out the window completely and that there will uh, be more discipline imposed when the economy recovers. If, what does that mean for what the Chancellor should do in the budget? Uh, I mean, I think going, as others have said, uh, going big in the same way that uh, President Biden is suggesting in the US is, is probably not needed in the UK, given what's already been announced and uh, the more developed welfare state that we have. Um, but I think I would tend to err on the side of going larger rather than smaller, not least um, if uh, premature cutting of support could lead to um, increased uh, scarring on the economy uh, in the future. Yeah, I, but I think in the, in the longer term that there, there will be an, a, a need for, for tax rises, as Robert was just saying, and the Chancellor might like to set out some of the uh, principles uh, that's going to um, govern his approach to that uh, over the next few years. Um, if I could sort of go back to um, some of the, the points that uh, Gemma and Robert uh, made on, on, the, uh, on the proposal earlier. Um, so given that there's going to be uh, crises from time to time that would increase uh, debt, should we then overachieve in, in good times rather than um, a, having this uh, deficit limit that we propose that uh, only would stabilize level uh, debt at uh, at the target level well I, you know i think we've been unlucky in the last 10 15 years with two 
very big crises that have led to very significant increases in debt. Um, hopefully we may be in for uh, better luck going forward and um, we won't be uh, in that situation where you are getting towards the uh, the limit wherever that is. Um, in any case, if if you do have um, with this deficit limit, if you do start off with a with a high level of debt, even running a small deficit gets the uh, debt to GDP ratio coming down uh, reasonably quickly. Um, you know, Gemma also pointed out the the um, target the um, the idea that the, there's other forms of net worth the government want might want to target around human capital and things like that. Um, I think. As those sorts of, uh, of investment are going to be required year to year, uh, from an intergenerational fairness perspective, you might want to um, pay for that out of current uh, taxes, as you will have to um, pay that every year um, going forward anyway. Um, and but you know, as Gemma also said, if those things do boost the, the long term growth rate, that that does have a, a feedback effect on the on the deficit limit. So that the faster the economy is growing, the higher the deficit you can run um, and still keep uh, debt at a, at, a, at a stable level. Um, and finally, um, is it too early to announce something in the budget? Well, yeah, I think, as I said earlier, the, the, what we were trying to do with designing this framework is that it's something that uh, that is for for all weathers. Um, so, actually, um, by having by by setting out a, a framework that does allow some um, additional stimulus in the near term, but does keep you on, on a sustainable path go, uh, going forward. You know, I think, um, you know, I think that would be a, a good thing, no, irrespective of what happens over the next few years. Okay, thanks, James. Now we are pretty much out of time, but I just want to come back to our guests with one final question before we let them go, um, and and that's around. Um, you know, we've had this almost twenty-five year experiment, I guess, in the UK with uh, setting various fiscal rules, tearing them up starting again and um, so where where do you, the panelists think we're going to be in five or ten years time with with this whole approach to managing the public finances are we going to be be still in a world of changing rules every uh, uh, few years as they don't work are we going to uh, come across something more stable and stick with it or are we going to junk the whole approach because it's it's a silly approach and uh, move to something different whatever that may be. Um, so uh, maybe we'll go in reverse order. Um, Robert, do you want to give us the last word on that? I suspect it will be business as usual. Governments will continue to think that, you know, there is some gain and no great cost to setting out uh, a target. Um, I suspect that the rest of us will look with a slightly raised eyebrow. Okay, great. Jill? Um, I'm afraid I think I have to agree with Robert. I think governments will continue to think that it's a useful way of framing their political ambitions and drawing some red lines between themselves and the opposition. Um, so that will continue to happen. But I also think that, I mean, your excellent proposal, notwithstanding that it, it is hard to frame these rules in such a way that they are robust to all states of the world and therefore would expect that they will keep getting uh, ditched and revised. Great, um, final word, Adam, to you. Um, I completely agree with Robert and Gemma as the forecast. Um, I think ultimately what matters for the UK are the real factors. Uh, you know, as Robert, as Martin Wolf pointed out yet again, the underinvestment in R&D, the real damage done by Brexit. These are the things that ultimately determine debt sustainability for the UK, not the fiscal policies in the short term. But, and again, to echo something Robert said, that you need to think about how the UK looks in comparison to its peer set. Um, that will, I think, increasingly become an issue for the UK going.
Fantastic. So that's that's great news for think tanks. We'll be in business talking about this for many years to come, I'm sure. Um, thank you all for joining. Thanks to our panellists who've been really excellent. And, and I've certainly learned a lot this afternoon. Do have a read of the paper on our website and uh, do join us again for another TBI talk soon. Have a good afternoon and evening. Thank you.